Um, so for our message today, um, this message uh, is for the person that's at the edge of their breakthrough. Um, when I say the edge of your breakthrough, I mean that there is a moment, there is a time, there's a situation that is about to occur in your life and you don't even know it, but you're right at the edge of it. You're right at the edge of success. You are right at the edge of evangelism. You are right at the edge of a blessing. You are right at the edge of a breakthrough. And whether you know it or not, this is what I'm here uh, uh, to preach and teach to you this morning. Uh, because I feel it in my spirit uh, that I'm here to remind you that you're here for a reason. Amen. I feel it in my spirit that I'm here to share with you that this church is on the edge of a breakthrough. Amen. I I'm here uh, to tell you that God is getting ready to do some incredible things through you. Somebody say through me. Yes. If you're a lady and you got one of them little pocketbook mirrors, go ahead. Look at yourself through me is what I'm saying, through you. He's getting ready to do some amazing things through you. And you're on the edge of this breakthrough. But, but what seems that might be the issue or might be the problem is that there are some things holding us back from the breakthrough. You see, you, you might have heard people say things like, it's darkest before the dawn. Or, or we fall down, but we get up. Don't let me start singing up here. You know, they, they say, tonight we mourn but joy shall come in the morning, right? The church, this message is about that morning. The, the message is about that joy. Uh, the message is about uh, uh, getting up, the get up. The message is about the breakthrough. But sometimes before you get to the breakthrough, you got to go through some things. And so the breakthrough is this moment of realization. It's a moment of hope and understanding. Uh, the breakthrough is this moment of complete acceptance in God's plan. The breakthrough is the epiphany of eternity. The breakthrough is the moment when the chains and obstacles that once bounded you have been released. We get our main passage this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. And I looked at uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, because Brother Bradley has been preaching to us about uh, as the Israelites were asking for a king and God sent them Saul. Uh, uh, and fast forwarding to their second king, who was King David. And I just did that to give Brother Bradley some room so he could continue in his excellent messages about Saul, if that's his choice. But to fast forward to David, David had some issues of his own. He was a, a, the second king of the Israelites meant to kind of fix some of the issues and mistakes that Saul had made, uh, set to be a, a better example for a leader for God's people, uh, uh, set to be a person after God's own heart. But he had his issues, too. Just like you and I, he has his issues, too. And now oftentimes we look forward to the person coming up or the second person to say that the things will be better or different, but people have their issues too. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to look at a specific issue that David had come, had come across and the breakthrough that happened there because of it. In verse 13, the Bible says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David. and He became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. Church, the, the title of our message this morning is The Blessing in a Breakthrough. And what I want to tell you this morning is that David, just like many of us, had a breakthrough. Uh, he had a moment where he had to realize and come to a greater epiphany and understanding of how God works. 
But in his breakthrough, he had to go through some things. The first point that I want to bring to you this morning is that one of the reasons why you haven't had your breakthrough is because you need to break up. You you ain't had your breakthrough because you ain't went through the great breakup. You see, there are some things that we need to break up with if we want to see our breakthrough. You see, David, though a man after God's own heart, though a man anointed to be king over Israel, though he was a successor to Saul's throne and meant to be an even better choice for king, David had his own issues. David needed to break up with his ego. David had a bad, toxic relationship with his ego. Church, I'm trying to say, you know, they, they call these things these relationships that we find ourselves in with people, but not only with people, but with things and not only with things, but with attitudes and not only with attitudes, but with actions. We, 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 we create these bonds and these relationships with these things that are toxic for our life. And what I'm telling you this morning is that we need to break up. We, we need to call and have a talk. It's not you. It's me. I'm changing. <laughs> we need to call and have a talk and say, listen, things ain't been the same, been how it used to be. I'm moving on. We can't be friends. Usually people say, we can still be friends. No, some of these toxic relationships we need to break up from, we don't need to be friends either. I'm here to talk to y'all this morning. I don't know. So, so somebody say, oh, we're going to read some scripture. He's going to say some stuff, and then he's going to sit down. No, I'm here to really talk to you this morning. And the worst thing about these relationships is it be the people that you just find to love the most. It be the people that's supposed to love you the most. And it's so tough because you're trying to work things out. And at some point, it's, man, we need to break up. But it's not just like I said, it's not just people. David needed to break up with his ego. David, let me tell you why I mean with, with, with David and his ego. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, David wanted to take a census of the army. And, and he wanted to take a census of the army, you know, during his kingship. By this time, God has already led them through countless battles. God has already shown him, uh, uh, shown them that when you have God on your side, uh, you're going to make it through. Uh, when you have God on your side, you will win the battle. But but though this was the case, he still wanted to take a census of his army. Why? Because of his ego. Let, let me see just how many soldiers I have. Uh, let me see just how strong we are. Uh, let me see just how mighty this army is that I have built and we have put together. It's his pride. It's his ego. And Nathan goes to him and he tells him, we don't need to take a census. We don't need to do this. This is against what the Lord's will is. And he still wants to take the census. He says, I mean, let me count. I want to see exactly how many it is. And so when the count is done, it brings up to about, you know, over about a million folk. You know, we, we got a pretty large army here. And he's proud again. Yes, because why? What are you saying about the number of the army? That the more people that you have, the greater and more successful you will be? That's not the case when it comes to God. Uh, 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 who is that? Was that Malachi? Oh, I mean, uh, let me get, not, not get confused. But God had to cut the army down in, in half. And then cut it down again and then remove the weapons. And then just to show you, I'm going to send you into battle, not with the most that you have, but with the least that you have, because I'm on your side. Now, that's not that's not David in this case. In this case, God says, I'm going to give you three choices. And one of the choices was one that David chose. He chose he chose the three days of plagues. And because of the plagues, the men in his camp and his army was cut down by 70,000. So, so David had this ego problem. And because of this ego problem uh, um, in counting the census, it actually led to him having less men than when he had before, if he had trusted God. But not only his ego, but David needed to break up with desire. In 2 Samuel 11, David had a tendency to see something, want it and take it. 
There, there's another case and occasion where David was hungry and he was by himself and he went and asked the man for some bread and there was no bread for David to have, but there was this other bread that was supposed to be offered for another occasion. And he said, well, I want that bread. David had an issue with desire. He see it, he wanted, he take it. And this is the case with Bathsheba and the sin that he committed to have her. His lust and desire for her sent him into conspiracy to murder Uriah. He succeeded in this because and because of it, God was displeased. See, David's desire and his ego doesn't sound like a man of God. It sounds more closely to what the Bible talks about in First John, where it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh, David and his desires of the flesh, the desires of his eyes. I see it. I want it. It look good. The desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father, but from the world. So the world, it says in first John 2 15, the world is passing away along with his desires. But whoever does the will of God remains forever. And so in other words, if you continue to hold on to the toxic relationship that you have, understand it will pass away because this world will pass away and it'll feel good and great now, but eventually it will pass away. So we need we, we, we have these relationships and attitudes and actions. And just as David needed to break up with his ego and his desire, we have some things in our lives that we need to break up with. Uh huh. Some of us need to break up with anger. Some people, I, I, I was, I was, I was, you know, I always practice my sermons with my wife. My wife, Tasia, she up there in the AV room. I practice, said, we need to break up with anger. Well, the Bible say you can be angry, just sin not. You know, and that's the thing that, that's the thing that people say. It say you can be angry, but sin not. And, and, but it also says that the fruit of the spirit is gentleness, is kindness, is patience. And all of these other things. Right. And, and so so we're saying one thing. So what are we reaching for? Are we saying we don't want to let go of anger so we can reach toward gentleness? So, yeah, be angry, but sin not. But are you reaching towards joy? Are you reaching towards peace? Some of us need to break up with our anger. I'm one of them that need to break up with this anger. That stream one coming on this morning. Oh, Oh, that streamed up internet, internet. <laughs> Some of us need to break up with our pride and ego. Pro probably one of the reasons because it's an ego thing that we're dealing with. We have this pride and ego. Uh, we feel like we're so much greater. Or we want to be greater or we want people to see us a certain way. And we got to break up with those notions because that's not what Jesus was about. Some of us need to break up with lust and immorality. Some of us need to break up with lust and these desires that we have in our heart. We see things we want and we take it. Some of us need to break up with laziness. Some of us need to break up with procrastination. See, you're trying to reach your breakthrough. You, you, you're trying to have that moment of clarity where the plan and vision that you have and what God has for you, you're trying to reach it, but you can't reach it because you're too lazy. You can't reach it because you're procrastinating. You, you can't make it to success because you're too busy uh, fornicating and lusting. You can't make it to do what God's will is because you got all these things that you just need to separate from. Some of us need to break up with doubt and fear. It's like we it's like we love to just doubt. We love we in this relationship. We call it all the time. Fear. Pick up the phone. I need to talk with you. We're in this bad relationship with doubt and fear and we need to break up. Some of us need to break up with hatred and negativity. I, I don't know what it is about when, it, when someone is doing something positive that all of a sudden we got to have a hater. When I'm trying to show love and when you're trying to show love and joy and all of a sudden someone wants to show hate in the moment. Well, this is good and great, but what about this? What about that? You need to 
to break up with that hatred and negativity. I know. So me, you don't listen to me, hear me what I say, and then go ahead. Uh, remember you was talking about that in the sermon? I'm still holding on to it. And that's fine. Hold on to your hatred and your negativity. Just don't expect a breakthrough from God. Some of us need to just simply just simply put it. We just need to break up with sin. We need to break up with sin. All of a sudden we started courtship with God. We started talking with God. We started ha- we started having long conversations with God. But all of a sudden we also in our DM, we got this sin also. We said, well, I'm just dating the field. I'm just trying to see my options. I'm trying to see my I'm trying to see who out there for me, who are going to find me. But when it comes to sin, sin, that's you got to break up with that sin. When God says, I will make you a new creation, when you are made a new in Jesus Christ, that's a relationship that should have been broken up with and thrown away. But somehow, some way, sin makes it back to us. Whatever the thing is in your life that you need to let go of, it's time to break up with it. You've been praying for God to give you success. You've been praying for God to give you blessings. You've been praying for God to give you strength. You've been praying for God to give you understanding. But have you considered that some of the attitudes and actions are the very things that are keeping you from reaching your breakthrough? It's time for breakup. Some of these toxic relationships got to go. You can read any newspaper or go on any website and you can see the headline. Because this is what happened. If you don't break up, you end up broken. And, and, and so when you when you won't break up with the thing that's that's breaking you down, you end up broken. And, and so we see it in real life. Let's take a real life example. We see the young girl. I just heard a story the other day. The young girl is in a relationship with her husband and it's abusive. It's physically abusive. It's mentally abusive. It's emotionally abusive. In all the ways that it can be abusive, it is abusive. And there's times where there's pain and there's times where there's anguish and there's times where there's some light and brightness, but it's mostly darkness. And everybody around her is saying, get your kids, get your clothes and get out. Everyone around is saying the same thing. And because the breakup won't happen and she's dealing with this issue, she ends up broken, not just broken like her heart is broken or broken like her mind is broken or broken like her emotions are broken, but broken like her neck is broken. But she had a chance. She had an opportunity. But you won't break up with the toxic relationship. You end up broken. What does what does Jesus say about it? Matthew 20, Matthew five and twenty nine. You know, preachers, we read the Bible, we find correlations, but we have to have context. Well, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to depart into hell. Now, now in the previous verses of this chapter, Jesus begins by speaking about adultery. So I don't want us to lose that context and just say we can apply this to every single thing. We have to have the understanding of what Jesus is preaching about or teaching about in this moment. Now, if the if the if the scripture didn't include adultery, then we couldn't apply it to adultery. But because Jesus begins, in other words, like an essay or begins his thesis on adultery, we have to believe and understand that the context of what he is saying is that you need to uh, uh, that he's applying it to this theory and thing about adultery, not just about anything we can apply it to. But but, but we're going to get to the teaching part. So the Bible says don't commit adultery in previous verses. This is what Jesus talks about. But Jesus came to more thoroughly teach and transform the mind and heart. So Jesus takes it a step further. Right. He says, if you even look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed sin 
in your heart. Then he teaches, then he gets to the eye and the hand, because in other words, if your hand is what's going to cause you to commit adultery, then you might want to do away with it. If your eye, that's right, so that's understanding. So then we have to say, well, is Jesus saying literally cut my hand off? Or is he saying, because of course, Jesus is about getting to the heart of the matter. He's about getting to changing your thinking on the matter. It's like people are saying, don't commit adultery. So they're saying, well, as long as I don't get all the way to the final act of the play, as long as I stop at like scene one, act one, <laughs> if we in theater, as long as I stop there. But Jesus says, no, you got to change the way you think and you got to change the way your heart is applied. Yeah. 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 So you might not even you might not do the thing. But because it is in your heart, he says, you got to get that out of your heart. You have to do away with these thoughts and these ideas and these ideologies. You have to you have to break up with some of these actions and attitudes. So Jesus is teaching specifically on adultery. But the spiritual principle that is gathered is that the much broader teaching is that sin begins in our heart and our mind. While some are focused on not committing adultery, going to the final act, the child of God is focused on keeping a pure heart. So it's time for the breakup. Put on some Drake. Call him up. It's time for the breakup. But if you don't break up, then you break down. See, J David, David wouldn't break up. He wouldn't break up with these actions and these attitudes, so he had to break down. And the thing about the breakdown is, is that it'll really break you down. Because as we read this passage where, where it talks about God saying, you know, the child that was born out of your sin is going to die. And it, it ain't even some, it ain't, that child has nothing to do with y'all. And that broke some of you down. Broke me down. But when we look at the story, when we look at the context of what's happening, David, David is doing his kingly thing, doing his kingly business. And he sees something and he see it as he wanted his desire. He ain't broken with his desire yet. So he sees Bathsheba bathing. And he decides, I see it. I want it. I'm going to take it. But 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 he ain't no stranger to women and wives and concubines. He's not a stranger to it. So it's not like he is a missing piece of the puzzle or something. The puzzle already put together. Stop looking for puzzle pieces. You know, how sometimes you make the puzzle and it's like one missing. It's like, oh, man, I missed that puzzle. So David is, is, is going beyond, above and beyond. And it's not even so much where he could just choose her and say, you've been chosen. I'm choosing up. And now you're mine because she already has someone. And I love I love when we look at Second Samuel, when we look at Nathan speaking with David and he says uh, on 15. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. On 15, it says after Nathan had gone home. The Lord struck the child that who? It says Uriah's wife. Uriah by this time is already in the ground. But, but, but the Bible is making it clear, David, that's not yours. Even at this point, it said the, 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 the child that Uriah's wife. The Bible don't, it, it don't miss, y'all. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. When it says something, it says it for a reason. It don't miss. Because it could have just said Bathsheba. It could have said David's new wife. It, all these other pronouns and, and other, other things that it could have called her, it said, no, Uriah's wife. Because we're not going to forget what you did to Uriah, David. So David conspired, murders, Uriah puts him on the front 
of the battlefield. Uriah dies. Now that he's dead, I can take Bathsheba. Nathan comes into the scene, sent by God to teach and, and, and tell David. He tells them this story. Now we're going to read this story real quick. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I got to make sure I get my Bible open. 2 Samuel chapter 12, so that we can read this, what Nathan said. It says in verse 1, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock. He ain't no stranger to wives and cars. He didn't want to take his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then the Bible says, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. This made up fictitious or probably true story that Nathan is telling. David is angry against this man from the story. It says, he says, he's, he angry. He says, as the Lord lives. It's kind of one of them things where people, you know, say, man, I put this on everything. Uh, uh, this, this, listen, as God is my witness, it's one of them kind of things, right? As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall, re and, and he shall restore the limb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, it's been preached time and time again, you are the man. So if you got somebody to be angry with, be angry with yourself. Says, I anointed you. Thus says the Lord of God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it were too little, I would add to you as much more. I gave and gave and gave and gave and gave. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have smitten Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have slain him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. Well, in other words, David, there is a reckoning to come from the sin that you have committed. There is a recourse and a, and a recompense. There is a chastening that needs to happen because of this thing that you did. Because you would not break up with your desires and your ego, now is coming a time for the breakdown. So he goes and he says, verse 13, here's his first breakthrough. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. So here is the realization. Here is the, here is the moment of clarity. Here is the point where the prodigal son uh, comes to his senses, if you will, and, and returns home. Here is the moment where David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan surely said, well, that's good. I'm glad that you recognize that. Nevertheless, because of the, you did what you did. And it's good that you repent and that you understand and ask for forgiveness, but you did what you did. So it said, the Lord, the, Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child, Uriah's wife, bore to David, and he became sick. And David, therefore, besought God for the child. And David fasted. Now, look, look, we're going to get to the point. And went in and laid all night upon the ground. 
And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground. But he would not. He wouldn't get up. You know, it's like a child. They go limp and you're trying to pick them up in the store and they just really just having a time. They just you got to drag them. I'm looking at my nephew. <laughs> you know, they just limp in the store and crying and you just got to drag them along. That's David. Don't pick me up. I need to be here on the ground. All my ego and pride is gone. My child, my child, my child that I was about to have with this woman that I like what I saw. Now this child is going to die. They couldn't get him up off the floor because now he's now he is now he is lamenting. Now he is in a moment where he is saying, I won't eat again, God. I won't look at nobody else, God. I will do everything that I'm supposed to do. We didn't all pray this prayer before. And if you haven't, just keep living. You'll pray it. I, 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 I promise I will not sin again. I will not do these evil things again. I'm going to change. I'm going to be different. Uh, I won't eat nothing. I'm going to lay on the floor and be humble. Just please don't take the child. On the seventh day, the child died. But here is the lesson. If you won't, if you won't break up with the things, then you will be broken down. And so David is now in this broken down state. And now he's doing all of the praying and all of the fasting and all of the studying and all of the service. Now he's doing all of the things that he should have been doing when he was conspiring to kill Uriah. He should have been doing those things, but he's caught up in his desires and caught up in his passions and caught up in his lust that he can't even do the things he's supposed to be doing for God. This is the nature of man. This is the kind of humility that God's been looking for all along. This is the kind of prayer and fasting and, and, and sacrifice God has been looking for all along. But it took the breakdown for you to have a breakthrough. Is this what, is this what we need? Is that what God needs from you? To break you down to your very core? To break you down to chasten you? To bring discipline to you in the swiftest of manners? In order that you have your breakthrough, you have to break down first? Do you need your spouse to leave you for you to love them? Do you need to be broke and destitute without food before you manage your money better? Do you need to be laying in a hospital bed before you do something about your health? Do you need to lose all your friends and family and church folk around you because you won't change your anger and hatred and negativity? You need to be alone and lonely before you say, Maybe it's me. Do you need to be without God before you transform your life to live for him? This is the nature of man. Some people won't even change the oil in their car until they see the smoke coming from the engine. You, you, you won't put gas in your car until you see, well, hit E. I go a little far past E. It's the nature of man. You see, it's on E. It's on. That's the fake E. That's the false E. It ain't. It say it's empty, but there's something in there. Then when you get past E, there's still well, some fumes left. You won't put gas in the car until you're on the 91 and AAA behind you. Then here go the tri AAA man with the little jug. Yeah, so you didn't see you was running out of... You didn't see you was running out of gas? No, well, I thought I could make it. I, I was, the exit was right there. I thought I could... Oh, okay, cool, cool. And it's just, this is the nature of man. 
why do we have to be broken down before then? Why do we have to catch the disease, the illness? Why do we have to go through the issue, the problem? Why do we have to be alone and destitute for us then to say, God, help me? Some people, all right, I done made the point already. Some of y'all lights cut off before you pay the bill. It's okay. I just, I used to keep calling back when, back in the day. I just, can I get an extension? You want an extension for your extension? Because we already gave you an extension. So you need a payment arrangement. We need to know something coming in. And don't mess around and not pay the payment arrangement. They cut it right off. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm going to get ready to close. Get out of here. You know, <laughs> you know what gangrene is? A frostbite? Gangrene and frostbite? It can, it can start at the, at the very edge of your pinky toenail and make it up to your knee. And what it is, is the blood vessels are not receiving blood. So the, so the skin and everything along with it is dying. And anybody that see it can tell you, they'll say, hey, that's gangrene. You need to, that's frostbite. You need to, and it could be right at the tip. And the longer you wait to do something about it, the more of your body it'll take. And it's fatal. It'll take your whole life from something that's smaller than what you could see up here, traveling up your body, spreading throughout. Do we need to wait until we rot away our relationships and our love, our faith in God? until it is completely dead, and then we want to beg for revival. Then we beg for forgiveness and try and seek help, but you can save it if you catch it early. You can reverse the effects at the very least. You can cut it off before it overcomes the entire body. You know, I think of 1 Corinthians 12 when we get to talking about bodies and the members of the body and how the Bible talks about us being one body but various members in the body and, and the hand cannot say to the foot that you're not important and this can't say this to the other thing. We're all a part of one body. So when we're thinking about having this breakthrough as the congregation, as the church, as the church of Christ, when we're thinking about having this breakthrough and we know we need to break up with some things before we end up rotting away members of the body, this is the correlation. This is one correlation. But even in your own life, God is saying there is a breakthrough coming for you. But if you won't break up, you're going to be broken down. Okay, my last point is to break in. My last point is to break in. And, and, and the break in comes from this idea of Luke chapter 5. Um, because the, the break in is uh, uh, sometimes you get broke, you, you break up with things and you're broken, um, but it still just isn't enough. And, and you're callous and you got stuff guarded off and you need somebody to break in. You need to let Jesus break into your heart. Amen. Amen. And the thing about the break in is that a lot of times when you're trying to get your breakthrough, you're trying to do it by yourself. So when we look at this story in Luke chapter five, it says some men took a man. It's the story of the lame man, the paralyzed man who was not able to move his body to Jesus. Jesus is in this house and he's healing the folk that came to see him. And his blessings, the power to heal is in that room. And everybody that comes to him is receiving the blessing that they need to receive. And there's this paralyzed man who just can't move, so he can't make it into where Jesus is. And so the Bible says some men took the man who was not able to move. He was carried on a bed and they looked for a way 
to take the man into the house where Jesus was, but they could not find a way to take him in because of so many people. So the Bible says these men, not the paralyzed man, because the paralyzed man doesn't have the strength to do it. The paralyzed man is not powerful enough to do it. He's not able to do it. But the men who are helping him, they take him and they break in. They go to the roof of the house, the Bible says, because they need to find a way. And they make a hole in the roof over where Jesus stood. Then they let the bed with the sick man on it, uh, with the sick man on it down before Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. And so the break in had to happen, but it couldn't happen on your own. Uh, it couldn't happen by your own doing uh, because that's still that pride and ego that's messing with your mind saying that I'm going to break through. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be a blessing to others. I'm going to change things. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. But we're trying to do everything on our own. So the break in has to happen. And sometimes in order for you to have a breakthrough, you're going to need somebody with you to help you to do it. And what the story shows us is that it's not just anybody that these men, uh, uh, these men were helping the man, but it's not just for anybody or any case, but they were helping him to find Jesus. They were helping to bring him to Jesus. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, no matter how many partners or how many uh, 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 advisors or how many people you have in your life to help you, if it doesn't lead you to Jesus and Jesus being the strength and Jesus giving you what you need, then you won't have the breakthrough. But you need people and you need Jesus. So this is this is my message for you this morning. If you won't break up with the stuff, it'll break you down. And sometimes when you're broken down, somebody needs to break in. You got to let Jesus into your heart. You got to let him into your plans, your thoughts, your desires. Who's having a small group this last Tuesday Bible class? It was wonderful. It was great. You, if, you, if you want to attend, you should attend. Who's having this small group meeting? And one of the things came up was consulting God. And, and the idea that was given was, you know, sometimes if there's something that we feel we can handle, then we just handle it. And, it's, and we only really go to God in prayer if we feel like we can't handle it. But, but the idea that I'm presenting is that we got to let God in always. We got to lean and depend on God. Let him do it. Because if it was e easy, if you thought it was easy for you to do without him, guess how easy it is going to be with him. So we got to let him in. We got to let him break in. Uh, 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 you might need help from other believers. You might need help from friends and family. You might need help from mentors and trusted individuals. You need Jesus. Ultimately, the paralyzed man needed Jesus in order to be made well. So this is my message for you this morning. I pray that it is a blessing to you. I pray that it heals you. I pray that it inspires you, uh, uh, that it shows you that, hey, there is a change coming from my life. There's a breakthrough coming from my life. God is about to do something great in my life. But there's some things that I got to do first. I got to break up with some of these attitudes and these actions. And I need to do it quick before I get broken down. So this is my message for you. If you have not received the gift of, uh, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you need to hear his word, uh, hear that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that he was crucified and that he was buried in a tomb. But he arose on the third day and declared all power and authority has been given unto me. You need to hear that word for faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to believe that word for the Bible says he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, repent of your sins. As Peter told the crowd in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Every one of you uh, confess Jesus to be the son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Uh, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a seal unto your heart and unto your soul. Uh, that lets you know you have confidence that you can go before God with his spirit as your advocate. Um, this is the blessing that we pray for you if you have not accepted Christ. And if you have and you would like to ask for prayer at this time, I have two prayer response cards. We'll be looking in our chat room and we'll be looking for you to fill out a response card. Let us be standing at this time. If you have any prayer response on your on your heart, you may write that prayer response and deliver it as together we stand and sing the song of invitation.